Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today I'm at the Rock Island Auction Company to show you some fantastic original muzzleloaders. And what we have here is quite possibly one of the rarest that we're looking at here today. This is a very scarce documented Seven Years War era altered French Saint Etienne brass mounted flintlock musket with bayonet. It's a very early example of a French Saint Etienne musket originally manufactured in the late 1690s with its arsenal and most likely updated with brass mountings during the Seven Years War era from 1756 to 1763. These brass mounted muskets are Described on pages 299 and 302 of George D. Moeller's book, American Military Shoulder Arms, Volume 1, with this exact musket pictured from various angles and three pages. This musket was originally similar to the 1696 contract Grenadier musket configuration. It was stocked to the muzzle and had a single barrel band three ramrod thimbles, and a tapered wood ramrod. It probably was equipped with upper and lower bands and modified to accept angular socket bayonet and steel ramrod somewhere in the 1750s. This early musket's lower swivel differs from those in later arms in that it is riveted to a ring around the bolt and the stocks left a breech flat. The butt plate has a modified fleur-de-lis profile, a crown V marked on the left quarter of the breech, and faint remnants of the saint Etienne marking at the center of the early lock. The inspection initials at the side plate and inside the lock are EE ahead of an inverted LE carved into the right of the buttstock. I love early flint locks like this one. You can see, I think, the real giveaway of this being early, apart from the overall shape, is this massive lock seated in here. Uh, it doesn't get much bigger than this. I'd say this is nearly six inches long um, from front to back here. Uh, and there you have a massive bolt head going through the cock into the lock. Um, it's just something you don't see uh, in the late 1700s and early 1800s flint locks. They get much smaller. I would say almost half the size as this one. Um, I think that's a great giveaway. Um, but I love these massive early locks, this one being French in origin. Being as old as it is, this musket has been through a lot. We have quite a bit of pitting around the touch hole and the lock itself. I don't think it takes away from the story of this musket at all. It is worn around the lock here. You'll notice some cracks and some chipped wood, but being from the mid 1700s, I think this is to be expected. And I think probably more normal than not. Nevertheless, though, it makes for a really neat and interesting piece. We have to wonder what this musket saw, who carried it, what their lives were like, and how it ended up here stateside in 2021. Being a smoothbore, we don't have a rear sight, and we don't have any indication of a front sight either, apart from the bayonet lug at the front, and even it is probably 10 or 15 degrees off top center. Um, so I don't know how much you could really even use that as a front sight. I think this was more of a point and hope kind of thing uh, when you're shooting a musket like this. This rifle features a pretty plain curly stock. Um, there, there are some waves of grain through here. We see a lot of darkening and aging though around the lock and the tang, kind of masking some of that grain structure. I think the interesting thing about this piece as noted in the description is this front barrel band. These front barrel bands are much more common in later muskets, which means that this piece could have bridged that gap between an earlier design and what became a later design, maybe kind of an early prototype or a transition era of manufacture here, uh, where they wanted to try this out and experiment with it or get this to the field a little bit faster, make it feel a bit more updated. We have a couple proof marks here at the back of the stock where we have a couple letters carved in there as denoted in the description. And our butt plate here across the top of the stock has a fleur-de-lis pattern. I'm gonna flip it around here so that we can see the sling side. Many times we see a lot of discussion about how muzzleloaders like this were carried, um, especially with military usage. And I know slings come up a lot, even in contemporary discussion uh, about recreating these pieces. And, and while this doesn't necessarily indicate a wide usage, I think the application of the sling here is really interesting. We have it attached here to the first barrel band from the breech, and then attached here 
through a bolt that I believe goes into the lock plate here on the side plate side. Um, so we have a really simple French plate here with I believe a GI marking there, but the third bolt going back from the muzzle end um, is modified to accept this sling. And that swivel, it's not coming off of there, I, I imagine, unless you pull the bolt. It's still interesting. Nonetheless, it, it reminds me a lot of more modern slings um, that people put on modern firearms being on the side here. Um, it seems really practical, um, something that we don't see a whole lot, um, not necessarily in terms of practicality, but just in application for this time period. Being early, we're back to really large bolts and really rounded bolts here. You can see the pronounced profile of these bolts, especially from the top. And they are pretty worn, um, they've been used. And I think when we're looking at an original piece like this, the use that it's been through is part of the appeal for it. It's a really fantastic little slice of history that really makes you wonder. Another detail I'd like to point out is the interesting flare that we have here at the end of our ramrod. We have this nice swell at the end, very common, not out of the ordinary. From the diameter of the ramrod, as we see it go through the channel, out to that flare, that gradual change, is just, it's really pleasing on the eye and, and something I'm, I'm not quite used to, especially on some of these early military arms. On the underside here, we can see our trigger guard, well-worn, especially around the edges. We can see some indications here as we go around the actual trigger where there may have been some more detail in the initial casting or filing of this piece. Um, but much like the rest of the rifle, it is worn. Uh, again, not a bad thing. Goes back, this is attached with two bolts or two screws it looks like as it goes back halfway um, in the butt stock. We can kind of compare that length there. From the trigger to the end of the trigger guard is about the same distance as the end of the trigger guard to the stock. We see a little bit of ornate file work here at the entry pipe. This is the only ramrod pipe on this piece. The second would be ramrod pipe is absorbed basically into the front barrel band there towards the muzzle. Inside here, looking at the trigger plate, it looks like there is a nail or tack used to attach the trigger plate, which is a, a neat little detail. It's hard to tell if it's, if it's rusted or if it's some kind of uh, maybe even copper. I can't tell. <laughs> neat to see that the, the rear end of the trigger plate is held in by the trigger guard itself, but here at the front, they've added that um, little tack <laughs> there to keep it to keep it attached. Overall, this is a neat piece. I hope you've enjoyed taking a look at it. Uh, I know I've enjoyed uh, showing it to you here. If you'd like to learn more about this piece or any other pieces that we're talking about here today, please visit the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages. They're spending a lot of time sharing a lot of high quality pictures and information about these and many other muzzleloaders out there right now for you to check out for free. I think it's a great reference for enthusiasts and builders. And I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for putting in that effort and inviting me out to show you some of these fantastic original pieces. I'm Ethan, I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.